Tonight, um, we're going to continue to talk about this three-way stop idea. And I don't know if you noticed this in the prior weeks, when I put this little uh, chart together, it actually has three main components to it. We're talking a little bit about uh, the collision of identity, culture, and the desire to control. And uh, we've been talking a little bit about the pre-modern era, the modern era, and the post-modern era. And uh, we're in the middle of the modern era. And uh, tonight, what we're gonna do is we're going to talk a little bit about the modern mindset. And we've led up to that, talking a little bit of the influence of the Renaissance, the Reformation, and the Enlightenment. And so tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at these three main points up here on this particular um, uh, section, and that is the search for certainty, prioritizing facts over meaning, and believing in a static or mechanical world, and how the church is kind of bought into a modern mindset. Now we're on the other side of this, and um, we're all actually... Move, have moved into what is called post-modernity. But before we talk about that in the weeks ahead, what we're going to see is um, the Industrial Revolution and the development of science had a pretty profound impact on the world as a whole, and yet it produced a lot of tensions within the church. And you're going to see what I mean here in a moment. We have said that uh, these three main sections have different emphases. The pre-modern era was on authority, and it was representing God because the ecclesiastical authority found in the Roman Catholic Church would not be questioned. Um, the, uh, the Pope and the, the bishops and the papacy uh, basically dictated to people what they are to believe and how they are to live. But that was, an in, was in tension with the political authority at the time, the kings and those type of things until the time of the Reformation and that began to change. So tonight we wanna to concentrate on humanity and the development of humanity and the potential of humanity, but it caused a little bit of a tension point with the church. And you're going to see what I mean in a moment. We're going to turn to a key passage of scripture, and we're going to watch about a 15-minute video that I think is very instructive on how we are to think about this passage of scripture uh, when we talk about um, the Bible being inspired and how it led to the belief that the Bible is inerrant, without error. So this has been something that we have um, just basically um, believed uh, without really thinking through the consequences of it, but tonight we're gonna do that. So with that in mind, here we go. Um, it's interesting that we always encourage people when we read the Bible uh, to understand it's a different context in a different time. And I think people, take note of that. And all you have to do is see some of the strange customs and culture that we find in the Bible. And we know it's a different context. However, rarely do we emphasize, and that's what this study has been about, understanding our own context, because that's what we bring to the text. We bring our own context, and we might be aware of some of its influences. We might not. So what we need to do is understand that everyone who has ever lived, no matter what age they have lived in, they basically swim in a body of water that is their own culture, their own context, and their own customs. Now, this changes a little bit from age to age, but no one escapes it. And when we read the scripture, we bring our culture and we tend to read it back into the text. And that is where I think a lot of misinterpretation can take place. So our biggest challenge is living between two worlds. And that is there's the ancient world of the Bible and our own world. And how do you integrate the two of them? That's a very challenging process. Well, 
there's a whole science that's dedicated to that. It's called hermeneutics, which basically means principles of interpretation. What is it that you got to keep in mind? And what do we bring to the process of reading? No one reads the Bible without interpreting it. It's impossible. The minute you open it up, you're already making evaluations of what you're reading and you're trying to interpret what its meaning is. So we are balancing these two different worlds. And I think what's important in our study in this summer session here is well, how does our worldview sometimes take precedence over the biblical context? And where does that send us off course? So what I wanna do is talk a little bit about the church and especially one branch of the church that we call evangelical fundamentalism. Whether they realize it or not, um, the evangelical fundamentalist type denominations has bought in to the modern mindset. Now you hear a lot of preaching that's a, that kind of condemns the current culture, but the reality is we don't escape that culture. And sometimes we are blind to the fact that actually we are living within the mindset of the modern culture. And that's where we want to talk about searching for certainty, priorit prioritizing facts over meaning, and believing in a static or mechanical world. So let's first talk about the search for certainty. That begins with Rene Descartes. Now, we already talked about him. We're not going to chew our cud twice on that. But what's important to keep in mind is because Rene Descartes, even though he was a philosopher, he was primarily a mathematician. He believed in the fact that numbers don't lie. So two plus two is four, three plus three is six. You, you know, it is what it is. Someone can't come along and say three plus three is nine. No, numbers don't lie. So what he did is he began to stress those type of things that is reasonable. And the reason led him to doubt everything. And when he, doubt, when he doubts, he came up with that famous statement, I think, therefore, I am. And when he says that, he couldn't get away from the fact that his mind or his reason was the one thing that he couldn't doubt. Now, with that in mind, if reason with the approach of mathematics, trying to figure out the world through what is logical, um, what is the ultimate unshakable foundation for reality or the facts of life? So that develops during this era into three camps. So Descartes and a guy by the name of Baruch Spinoza and Gottfried Leibniz said, it's reason alone, it's thinking alone. Whereas individuals like Francis Bacon, John Locke, and a guy by the name of David Hume said, no, we have to trust our senses as well. It's not just thinking because we might be able, to, we might get off track in our thinking. So we have to trust our senses. Then there was a guy, uh, a philosopher by the name of Immanuel Kant that came along that says, no, both are equally essential in discerning what we can know for certain. Now, all of these philosophers were basically looking for the same thing. How can we be certain about life? What is it that is rock solid? What is it that can't be shaken? So the problem was every time they approached the various things uh, that give to us knowledge about life, they reasoned it to the point where it wasn't an, an undoubtable foundation. And there were holes in it. There was uh, things about it that could be argued against. So um, the church comes along and in the modern mindset, they began to look for an undoubtable foundation for knowledge. What is it do you think that they determined was the unshakable, undoubtable foundation of knowledge? The Bible, okay? So the church began to say, the Bible is the only thing that you can really trust for 
knowledge and facts and that type of thing. Now, that sounds good until you begin to look at where it leads. So um, fast forwarding, and let me say um, parenthetically here, that we're gonna double back and talk about the American mindset a little bit later. So we'll come back to a couple of these points a little bit later. But because the church bought into this desire for certainty, what began to emerge is you can find what is certain if you have good apologetics. Now, apologetics is defending the faith, okay? And so what happened is there were writers and thinkers and preachers that began to say, well, let's argue for the certainty of truth that is found in the Bible. And here's where the leap becomes uh, important. It said that the Bible is the sole source of inerrant truth. Now, that word inerrant is really important because you get writers like, I think most of us have heard of John MacArthur. Okay, he was on Moody Radio for years. I don't know if he still is. Uh, Grace to You was his radio show. Back in 2007, John MacArthur published a book called The Truth War, Fighting for Certainty in an Age of Deception. And his argument was the Bible is the sole source of inerrant truth. And if you disagree with that, then you've been deceived. And, um, and so he imagines this sort of like a war and his whole approach was, we're gonna fight for certainty because if you interpret the Bible correctly, you can be certain about everything. Just keep that in the back of your mind. So this modern mindset that's influenced by the philosophers that came before, now develops kind of a warrior type thing. So philosophers understand that they'll disagree and they'll argue and that type of thing. But in the end, they respect each other's abilities to think through uh, their knowledge and their, their abilities. But something new begins to develop in the church. And that is, you, you can be certain about what you believe. And it's so it's such an important foundation, you have to fight for it, okay? Now, that will lead to all kinds of church subculture wars, okay, for people that interpret things differently. Now, I think the most important thing that we find taking place is the opposite of certainty is not doubt. In this perspective, the opposite of certainty, and it's found in the title, is deception. So now the judgment becomes, okay, this is an irrefutable fact. The Bible teaches it, and I believe it. But if you don't believe it, it's not like you're doubting a particular teaching of the Bible. It's that you have been deceived. All right, do you see the spiritual angle to that? Uh, so that's a whole different world. So now what takes place in extreme fundamentalism, you take the gospel, the good news of the life and ministry of Christ, his resurrection, forgiveness, the promise of forgiveness and eternal life and all these things, and you begin to join it to certainty. And all of a sudden, the gospel is certainty about certain interpretations of the Bible. And that is what is true. And if you disagree with me, you have been deceived. Do you see that, what that can do to the church? It continues to uh, fracture the church because now there's only one small group that has all the truth. All the other people have somehow missed the boat. Does that make sense to everybody? So the church doubles down basically in its search for certainty and the Bible as particular individuals interpret it that becomes the unshakable foundation. 
But the problem is, it is it was stated that the Bible is all you need, whether it's for counseling, economics, uh, the environment, all these complex things in the modern world. The Bible is all you really need. So you have people that begin in the 70s, like Jay Adams. Uh, he would, he was a counselor. He says, all you need is the Bible. So anchor counseling that Jenny Fetzer started would be anathema because she uses psychology and psychiatry and, and uh, you know, all these type of things on top of biblical principles to help counsel people through their troubles. So you get this extremism. So it becomes very judgmental. The problem is this point right here. The Bible is 100% accurate in everything it states. Okay, I want you to think through that for a moment. The Bible is 100% accurate in everything it states. Well, you can see kind of where this is going to go. Genesis 1 talks about uh, the cosmos be, being created in what this group would say, six literal 24-hour days. And all of a sudden now it's going to come up against science that says the universe is billions and billions of years old. But this, no, but the Bible says six days. And so it's got to be right. And so now you begin to discount science. Oh, they don't know what they're talking about. Well, that's okay when you're talking about things like creation, but what about if you need open heart surgery? You need science and you need to understand that they know what they're talking about and they've done their research um, before a doctor picks up a scalpel to do an open heart surgery. You better believe in science, right? Or you're in trouble or you won't have the procedure done. So the argument then develops, and this is what's important. The, this argument that the Bible is 100% accurate in everything it states, that's only true if the Bible is inerrant. So you'll hear within Christian circles, we believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. We've all heard that. So now what will happen is if the Bible is not inerrant, certainty goes out the window because your foundation is not as solid as what you want it to be. So that brings us to 2 Timothy 3.16. I want you to take your Bible and turn open to 2 Timothy 3. And here's the key verse, okay? The key verse you've heard over and over again. Yeah. Um, uh, no, this is not approved workmen need to be ashamed. That's 2 Timothy 2.14. This is 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So you see that word there, God-breathed. That becomes the foundation stone that then leads to the idea of inerrancy. So inspiration leads to inerrancy. But is that what this verse is saying? So we have to look at the context. Verse 10 is the paragraph start. Paul is talking to Timothy. Remember, this is his last letter that he will write. This is his very last letter. And he is writing to Timothy and basically, he's charging Timothy to take over his ministry and continue the mission of spreading the good news. So he is writing as his life is winding down. He's sitting in prison at the time. Uh, and what we find is that he's going to um, basically be very, very close to uh, his life being ended. So verse 10 He's talking to Timothy, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, sufferings, 
what kind of things that happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those uh, you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scripture which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus then it comes to verse 16 all scripture is god breathed and it's useful for teaching rebuking correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of god i.e. timothy you may be thoroughly equipped for every good work that you're going to continue. Now, the previous verse is very interesting. Timothy, you have learned the scriptures from infancy, and you've known these scriptures, and then it says they are able to make you wise for salvation. And then he says the scripture has this inspiration to it to do what? To teach you to rebuke, to correct, and to train in righteousness. <clears throat> now, usually the context is ignored. When we talk about inspiration, at, founded in this one verse, it's usually talking, uh, usually people are talking about how the Bible being inspired then becomes inerrant. Do you see any of that in this context? What I see in the context is the encouragement for Timothy to continue to get wise from the scriptures so that he will be equipped to carry out Paul's ministry. Does that make sense? So now the question becomes, should we connect this idea of inspiration with this idea of inerrancy? Now, here's the problem. The Bible never claims to be inerrant. That's an assumption based upon the idea of inspiration. So the logic goes like this. If the Bible's inspired, which I believe it is, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's 100% accurate in everything it states because it's, it's couched in its own context in a different culture. Times have changed. So inerrancy, I don't think, is connected to this verse, personally. Inspiration is here, but what does that mean? So I have this um, video that uh, will help you to understand this. Um, one of my favorite authors is Dr. Pete Enns, and he's been doing this uh, online series, um, just a discussion, basically, with a uh, lady that's asking some questions that's called disproving the proof text. In other words, it's interesting how the church has taken certain verses and have deified them to be the proof text for a lot of beliefs. So he's going to talk about 2 Timothy 3.16. I think you're going to find it very helpful. So are you ready to watch it or do you have some questions or comments at this point? Okay. All right, Pete, Second Timothy 3.16. Oh, yeah. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. Right, yeah. yeah. I mean, well, first of all, I mean, that is a passage that shows a lot of respect for scripture. And I mean, it means the what Christians call the Old Testament, there's no New Testament at this point. And, and some have said, by implication, it means the New Testament. No, it doesn't. It's This is about the Hebrew scriptures, that's all that this is about. But that's fine, right? Um, so, but what is it saying? Like, what are the implications of it? And very commonly, at least in, in some Christian circles, this is sort of a proof text for why the Bible's inerrant. Yeah. 
because it's God breathed, right? So it's it's inerrant for matters of history or science or anything moral, you know, I mean, everything you just sort of, like, this is the text you go to, this is the top text to prove a particular way of reading the Bible. And I, I think that's problematic. I think that's actually overreading this passage. It is, it is a really very important passage. But uh, for one thing, you know, all scripture is God breathed. The word is, is not in Greek. Greek works that way. Sometimes you leave the verb to be out and, and it still works out. But you know, to say all Scripture is God breathed—that's that's not definitely what the text says. Just and you know, we're not making things up here, but just as easily grammatically, it could say every God breathed Scripture, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Which is a little different, right? So it's not making this declarative. You know, all Scripture is God breathed. There's your inerrancy, but it's not saying that. It says all all God breathed Scripture is useful. It's profitable, as some translations say. Well, for what? For for you know, for uh, teaching, right? For for uh, correction, for training in righteousness, and and uh, reproof, and things like that, and to equip people for every good work. Okay, now hold on here a second. This is what we're reading here. Another way of putting it: this is not a proof text for inerrancy. This is a proof text for wisdom. Scripture studying Scripture gives you wisdom. Well, what parts of it? You study all of it. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, it's not um, a, a, a license for proof texting, all scripture. Well, here's a verse. Yeah, but verses don't stand alone. Verses have context. So it's it's not all in, on like the verse level. I th I think, I mean, this can be debated, but I think all is more the flow of it all. And when you let the different parts sort of talk to each other, even debate each other. See, because the Bible that we have is not a Bible where every author is on the same page. You have diverse points of view. Even, you know, Paul and James didn't get along. You know, I mean, that's pretty documented. They had differences of opinion. Chronicles doesn't agree with Samuel Kings. You have different laws in the Old Testament that are, well, they're the same law, but they sort they do contradict each other in places. So whatever it means that all Scripture or all, all God-breathed Scripture or every God-breathed Scripture is profitable or useful, I think it's it's... Taking, you have to take into account the character of Scripture itself. You can't just whittle it down to a proof text verse or two that sort of makes your point. You have to, in other words, the Bible is a wisdom book, not sort of an instructional manual, go to the index, find the verse, and there's your answer. That's, um, that's not a high view of the Bible. That's actually, I think, a very low view of the Bible because it sort of absolves us of the responsibility to take it seriously enough to just sit with it in community and not lift verses out of it that are just oftentimes out of context yeah, or something yeah. like that. So. so for you, would you say then that while this passage wasn't talking about the entirety of the Bible, because at that point, once again, the New Testament wasn't collected or canonized, it was talking about the Old Testament, but it could be talking about the whole Bible, not that that was the intent of the author, but you could affirm that all of the Bible is useful and profitable. Right, including the New Testament. Including the right. New Testament. Yeah, right, so, I mean, we have characters of the Gospels where they differ on things, and, right. you know, everyone knows that, and, and Paul's not the most consistent person who ever wrote. In different letters, he says different things, and yeah. it depends on the context. You know, we're reading somebody else's mail and their situations we don't understand. And then you have, you know, Revelation, which is mm, whatever that is going on, you know, whatever's going on there. Um, so it's it's showing the respect for the complexity of Scripture and that it's worthy of our adult attention, not sort of like just picking passages here or there. And that includes the New Testament, sure. Uh, it's, it's to drive us towards wisdom and, I think, communion with God through wisdom. It's not a proof text that says you can never, like, look at a Bible passage and say, I'm not sure about this. Yeah. This doesn't sound right to me. I mean, that, there's, you know, where Christians can take a page out of Judaism, for example, where debating God, read the book of Job, right? Debating God and debating Scripture is part of the tradition. That's actually a form of worship in Judaism, but in Christianity, you're not allowed to do that because of this one passage. It's like, I mean, a Jew, a Jew wrote that. <laughs> you know, they understood the, 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 the multivalence of Scripture and the importance of really taking it seriously enough to hear all those voices. And sometimes there are things you just, you're not sure about. That's not faithlessness. That is actually struggling with the scriptural tradition. This passage doesn't undo all that. It's actually supporting that. 
because it's God-breathed, it's profitable for these things that are listed. Well, how is it profitable exactly? Uh, well, now you got us talking because then you have to flesh out the details, yeah. right? And that's part of the journey of just being, I think, a Bible reader and I think, frankly, a Christian. Yeah, that's so good. Mm -hmm. So talk to me more about God-breathed. What, what is that? Uh, I mean, it's, it's a word that doesn't show up anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And that isn't the most important thing to say, but it's, it's like... It's not automatically sure what that means, but I think what the author is saying is that Scripture is, is God-influenced. You know, um, it, I, it doesn't mean that God breathes like into the brains of biblical writers to make them write exactly these words. I, I don't think so. If you want to think that that's fine, but then we have to come to terms with the fact that the kind of Scripture that God breathed is diverse in places contradictory. We have different points of view, all of which is leading us toward discussion and dialogue and debate towards wisdom and communion with God. So yeah. that one word, you cannot build what, what Christians call a doctrine of scripture. You can't build it on that one word. It's descriptive, I think, of what Jews in general would have thought, that this is, this is our sacred text. It's from God in some sense. But God didn't sit down and write it, and God didn't whisper in Matthew's ear or Paul's ear saying, write exactly this. Um, we're seeing both, I mean, I mean, you know, how like inspiration and revelation works, nobody knows. But there's something divine and human going on in the Bible, uh, sort of like Jesus, you know, there's divine and human going on, right? Um, so, I mean, that, to overread that word, God breathed, which is one word in, 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 uh, in Greek, is very tempting. Don't give in to the temptation. Just appreciate it. Yeah. But don't try to build a whole theology of the Bible off of that one word. Right. Because a lot of people are inheriting a belief around God breathed. That means that it's perfect. Right. And that everything that God just, like Greg Boyd says, is lobotomized people. Right. Where he took out the brains of authors and then put in the Bible and then out came this perfect exactly. Bible. Right. Right. But that's just not in reality what we have. But what we have, to your point, is actually more incarnational. Right with right. like this Jesus, humanity and divinity. So talk more about why that could actually be like great news and beautiful. Well, I mean, it's the Christian faith is interesting because of the degree to which God is part of creation, right? Not just Christianity, I mean, Judaism is, as well, but we have the Jesus part too, where it's sort of like in a special infused way, we have this, uh, a, a picture of God with us and what that can look like in very concrete terms for us. So uh, that is good news. That is what makes Christianity more than um, a philosophy, even though philosophy is important. It makes it more than a theological system, although theological systems are important. It makes it more than the Bible. It makes it God is present with us, and the Bible paints pictures of that presence in its own contextually meaningful ways, you know, whether it's Genesis 1 and 6 days or whether it's the walls of Jericho falling down, or whether it's you know a book like Job, or whether it's the Gospels or Paul's letters. They they paint a picture of what it means for God to be with us, and that's that is um, to me really nice to hear because it's not a book that was dropped out of heaven. It's a book that honors humanity. It honors the human process, and that's a really piece of good news for me that the God of creation, uh, what's the word? You dignifies. Know, dignifies, mm -hmm. works with. Mm -hmm. But I don't even like that, because that means God's out there and we're down here. But what if it, the whole thing is like is this? It? It's, it's just there, you know, and, and God doesn't make cameo appearances, but God is constantly in and with humanity. So in other words, when I see things like... Uh, parts of the Bible that don't fit together very well. Well, God can't do that. Well, if God is co-working, so to, I mean, the words fail us, these are mysteries anyway, but if God is like in, infused and in those people, but respecting their humanity, you're going to have that. So in other words, the fact that Chronicles contradicts Samuel and Kings in many, many ways, that doesn't mean well, which one's God breathed? Yeah, yeah. They both are. They contradict. They can't. Well, they do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what does God breathe mean with a Bible that looks like that, right? So um, it, it doesn't, in other words, that quick God breathing and appealing to that for like some way, a form of an errancy, 
you can't sidestep what people call the problem of Scripture. I use a lowercase p. It's like, it is, it is, you do struggle through the Bible, right? What if that whole thing is what God breathed means, which means valuing and dignifying the humanity, right? Yeah. Uh, to me, that's, that is a very, like, finally, okay. Like, I can just breathe. I don't have to get it all right. I don't have to make it all fit. It's not a big jigsaw puzzle. The Bible's not a test from God to make sure you can get everything to fit right, even though it doesn't, right? Yeah. Um, it, it tells us we don't have to ignore science. We don't have to ignore psychology. We don't have to ignore developments in human thought. We don't have to deny quantum physics or any of these kinds of things. We get to be people in our time and place where God is with us. Yeah. And we partner with our tradition, which includes scripture, to talk about what's God like and what's God like here, right? And I, that whole process, I think, is actually infused by the, the presence of God, I think, in all reality, right? Now, we've gotten a little bit past our passage, but it's still, it's connected. Right? It is all connected. Yeah. How you read that depends sometimes on how you see the whole thing. Yeah, right? and it can shape your view of how you understand God to participate with humankind. Exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So last question about this, because I hear it from my upbringing coming in. Then where would the authority piece come in? So if humans and God partnered to create this, Mm -hmm. sacred text for us, mm -hmm. does it lose its authority because it was not downloaded perfectly from heaven? Okay, well, let's say, yes, it does lose its authority, so we can't do that. Let's go back to the old way of thinking. You still have to struggle with the fact that this authoritative text is messy and diverse and actually doesn't really tell you what to do very, very well. I mean, you, you think it does, but it doesn't. Even things like love God, love yourself, love neighbor, got it. Uh, a little help, how do I do that? What does it mean to love God here, right? There's always a wisdom dimension of trying to figure this stuff out, right? So I don't think it, that, what about the authority? Maybe we have to reconceive what authority even means, right? Maybe it's not authority here and here. Maybe it's listening to the presence of God in and through us in community, but never authority like God's telling you what to do now. Maybe God isn't telling you what to do, but maybe the way we enact authority is by seeking the divine voice yeah. in each other, right? Mm -hmm. In the Bible, right? In each other, in the history of thought. Christians have thought a lot about this kind of stuff, right? Maybe the authority is, I'm not sure what to do, but I'm not going to make a step without working through that process. Yeah. And I think that is an authority. Right? Yeah. So I the mean, authority is what you're saying, or what I hear you saying, is the authority is actually coming from discerning in the context of community, what this message is right. saying for your... And where God is present in that process, yeah. Okay. Yeah. rather than God is outside of the process looking down, right? I mean, to me, that's very important. You have to have sort of a belief in the Spirit of God being basically everywhere, which I think is, to me, that's Christianity 101. That's a very, very important thing. Rather than God is up there and out there, sort of aloof, and, well, I'll, I'll see you later. In the meantime, here's the Bible. Listen to everything it tells you to do. And that's actually not historically a Christian way of thinking about the Bible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's simply yeah. not. It's actually a very modern, it's a reaction to the, the idea that the Bible is being attacked, whether through science or Darwin, you know, or, or German higher criticism of the 19th century or geology. It's, it's being attacked. And so you sort of circle the wagons. This is a new problem. This is not an old problem. I love that. That's so helpful. Well, thanks for sharing about that. I hope it helps people as they're asking questions about the Bible. So do I. Yeah. So what do you think of the video? Was it helpful and or was it confusing? Okay. Okay. Where, where can we clarify it? I don't know. Okay. Anything? So his point is that inspiration is something that influenced the writings. But I think for our discussion tonight, and I'm going to illustrate this on this slide, it, it is not something that is downloaded from heaven with facts that are always true through through the ages. And the illustration is 
and I forgot to do this, and I apologize. There's a few passages of scripture that sound like uh, the sun is rotating around the earth. That's the way it, it, it sounds, okay? And this guy by the name of Copernicus comes along and through science, he says, no, the sun is not moving, we're moving, <laughs> okay? We're rotating around the sun. And because the Catholic church believed for so many years that actually the earth is not the center of our particular galaxy or universe or whatever, but the sun is the core on which all these planets rotate, then um, they condemned Copernicus. And Copernicus was uh, deemed to be a heretic. It took them 200 years. So this is in 1616 that Copernicus is condemned because it's this idea, if you read the Bible this way and you take it literally, then this is the truth. Well, science says, no, you can't take that literally. Uh, it's descriptive from a human point of view. It looks as though the sun is moving because it rises in the east and sets in the west, right? But in reality, science tells us it's we who are moving, it's not the sun. And it took them 200 years to finally agree with science that, oh my gosh, it is the earth that is rotating around the sun. So that's kind of the conundrum, is taking the Bible and thinking that it is always right on everything that it states. Well, the Bible is not a science book. It's just not. And so to take certain things and apply it to science is to misread the context. Does that make sense? Okay. So with that in mind, you go, oh, I guess this uneasy relationship that we have with science is because of our own perspective on how we think the Bible works. And that's that's what Pete Enns was getting across in that short video, is that inspiration does not necessarily mean that it is without error on everything that it talks about. So at times, you will have a perspective thousands of years old that because they didn't have telescopes or they didn't have the science behind it, when they stood and looked at the sky and they saw the sun rising in the east and setting in the west, they just naturally concluded that it's the sun that's rotating. Does that, does that make sense, everybody? Okay. So with that, now what do you do? So the fundamentalist approach then began to double down on the modern mindset through this idea of inerrancy to try to turn the Bible into a textbook, a modern textbook, even on science. And so when certain things come out in science, they have to make the Bible fit that. And that's a lot of erroneous interpretation, okay? Because that's not even what the Bible's trying to do is talk about science. So the difficult thing in all of this is when you take a literal approach on every verse of the Bible, you're gonna get into trouble, okay? Because now what do you do? If you dip your toe back into the Old Testament that says to stone a woman or to stone a man because of certain things that they violated as part of their cultural code back then, what do you do with that? You know, well, here's what some people do. They say, well, we might not agree with what what constitutes a death penalty, but we believe in the death penalty because it's there in the Bible. That makes sense to everybody? Any questions or comments on that? So the first problem is this uneasy relationship that it has with science. There will be people that will insist that the, uh, the earth is only 10,000, 12,000, 15,000 years old and, and, and it was created in six literal days. Well, what do you do 
with the fact that science says it's millions and billions of years old. Then you get into this idea where you go, well, God created it with apparent age. The apparent age of billions of years old? Why? Why would God do that? Why would, and now you're beginning to go, can we trust God? Because he's starting to do things that's not really jiving with what could, is being discovered. And, and, you know, I think that then doubles down on God's character to say, well, he created with apparent age. Can you please explain to me why he felt the need to do that? That this looks billions of years old, but it's only 10,000 or 15,000 years old. Do you see the conundrum here? when you try to make the Bible fit with science and try to think that it's a scientific textbook. Some comments, thoughts on that? So that will lead to this. And it's still being debated today, but it, it became a brouhaha back in 1925. Have any of you heard of the Scopes monkey trial? Okay, down in Dayton, Tennessee. Um, there was a teacher by the name of Scopes that he was a science teacher that was accused of teaching evolution, and that was a violation of Tennessee state law. And it became a big um, it became a big debate. Uh, and you you have and we might come back to this when we get back to the American mindset. But when you read the Bible, um, how do you read Genesis? when you consider science. That's really a part of the Scopes monkey trial. And so anyways, um, it leads then to different theories. So notice here, uh, oh, I guess the six days in Genesis chapter one uh, are not six 24 hour days, they're long periods of time. Okay, six ages or six epics or, you know, that type of thing. Others went to theistic evolution as an alternative. And then there's those that double down on seven literal days. And you, you fix the problem of dating with apparent age. So here's where the problem is. That's a modern mindset looking for certainty is what it is. How do I know how the world was created? Well, the Bible says this. Science says this, but you know what's at the heart of that? That's the modern mindset saying you can reason everything out and be certain about everything, okay? So when there's this conflict with science, usually there's a doubling down and then you build creation museums and you invite people in and give them alternate interpretations of parts of creation that says, see, this doubles down, or you have writers like Ken Ham, uh, Answers in Genesis, that type of thing, that will then double down on this seven literal days. Now, you can believe that if you want, but you got to deal with the science. That's the problem. So you can read it very literally, and you can do that through the whole text, but then when you come to certain things, you all of a sudden can't switch your approach. Does that make sense? Okay, I take this literally, but I don't take that literally. Okay, thoughts? Yeah, well, that then becomes the, that be, what Esty said is, then what do you do with revelation? If you're gonna take that literally, right? Well, that's where you get all of the, um, that's where you get all of this apocalyptic type um, literature that comes out, um, whether, you know, this is talking about the end of the world and, and, and that type of thing. And you have authors that ride that as a hobby horse. David Jeremiah, I don't think he talks about anything but eschatology. It seems like yeah, that's all he talks about. You know, uh, John Hagee is another one. And it's easy to get kind of out of balance with, and we went through Revelation a couple of years back. We talked about, you know, how do we approach this and that type of thing. But you're right, S, that 
how do you take a literal approach to the book of Revelation when you see a dragon and, and you see this and that or four the four horsemen of the apocalypse are these four literal horses the, my my opinion is no it's representative of something that was going on in the first century so thoughts there okay a couple more slides and we'll be done secondly so that all of that was the search for certainty second problem is prioritizing facts over meaning so People get obsessed sometimes with this question, what really happened? And for them, history is facts. Now, I used to think that, and I love history, but I used to think that history, you know, gave you all the facts. As an adult, I know now, that if you take something as simple as American history, you take a textbook, it's giving you a perspective of history from a particular interpretation of what went on. It's not facts uh, that this is the way it really went down. So we're in the middle of the January 6th hearings right now. What really happened on January 6th? Well, it depends who you're hearing talk about it. So you, you've heard the testimonies of some of the police officers. Now this um, Cassidy, who was an aide, she was testifying of what was going on inside the, the White House while this was going on. And so it's hard. My point here is it's hard to get to just the facts, ma'am. Dragnet, remember Joe Friday? Dragnet, just the facts, ma'am. It's um, it's hard to get that to be one hundred percent clear and accurate. But but the the but I guess what you do is you take what it comes and you can piece together a reasonable facsimile of what probably happened. But you're never going to know one hundred percent sure in every corner of what happened. So there was a movie, I wish I could remember the title of it, that took an event, we watched it a few years back and went over the same event from seven, I think seven different angles and, and how it kind of, oh, I wish I could remember the name of that movie. And you kind of go, oh, that's how this went down. Then they come back around a second time and show it from a different angle and go, Oh, that's a whole different ball game now when you look at it through this. So what happens here is facts of the past are more important in this mindset than the meaning of the past. So let's take the January 6th hearings that are going on right now. You might not get all the facts straight, but the meaning of it is pretty clear. There was an attempt to overthrow democracy. Whether I have all the facts right or not, that seems to be pretty clear. So in the ancient church, they did not take everything literally. They often looked not at some of the literal facts of the, the scriptures, but sometimes they looked for the moral aspect of it. Sometimes they looked for the allegorical. What story is this telling? And I give you an example down here. Is Jonah part of an allegorical type of literature? Because people who want the facts will argue the man, that a man could actually live inside a fish, a big fish for three days. Okay. Well, maybe that's not the point of the story. Maybe the point of the story is to teach a lesson you know, and then the future of what is told, what, where is this going, that type of thing. So this is not to put cracks in your faith. It's to help you understand that faith is a complex process of growing, maturing, and wising up. If we go back to that 2 Timothy 3.16. All of these things are to make us wise, to make better decisions. 
thoughts there? I think it's the trust from trusting the Bible and the interpretation that you've been given and to trust in God. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you could hear what Esty said. What she said was, this helps you to start to trust God more than an, a particular interpretation of the Bible. So you've been told a particular interpretation maybe your whole life, but now you need to focus more on trusting God than that particular interpretation. Did I say that correctly? Okay. All right, two more slides and then we'll be done for tonight. The third uh, element is believing in what I'm uh, calling here a static or mechanical world. Um, the idea that truth never changes over time. Now, when you take this approach where this is truth, this is certain, now you run into problems. What do you do with those passages where Paul seems to say a woman shouldn't be a pastor or women are to be subordinate to men or LGBTQ people should be excluded from the church or slavery was never abolished in the Bible. So I guess slavery is still okay. Um, the death penalty that we mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, if the belief that truth is always the same, that it doesn't necessarily become more nuanced as we grow as a civilization and as a species, that there are some things that were true from a perspective in the ancient world that we no longer sense is, is true for us today. So you take all of those food laws in the book of Leviticus, it might've made sense at the time to them for whatever reason, maybe they had certain convictions or maybe it was practical not to eat certain things. But the point is we don't live in that day and age anymore. And you know, the whole idea of not eating certain types of, of meat or th there's a, prohibition in the book of Leviticus, you're not allowed to wear blended fabrics. Why? You know, why can't I wear polyester? You know, why does it have to be one, you know, that type of thing. So that's a problem when you think that truth is static and it doesn't develop over a course of time. So now here's, here's where it comes down to where the rubber meets the road. In our day and age, the type of preaching that became very popular uh, during the, the modern era is what does the what is the Bible's perspective on marriage? What is the Bible's perspective on economics or money, money management? So pastors begin to develop um, sermons that go sort of like this. Here's five biblical principles for money management. Well, they'll go to picking out a verse here or there, or probably out of the book of Proverbs when it relates to money management, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's biblical in the sense of this is the only way to do it. So you have books that are written about money management. This is the biblical way. Isn't that sound intimidating? But what if that doesn't work for certain families that maybe a different way of managing their money works better for them than the, what the book is saying is biblical. So we often have to be careful about putting in quotations, this is biblical. Well, okay. Number one, was it written for that purpose? Now, three biblical principles to a great marriage. Have you read the Bible? I don't think I see a good marriage in the, the whole Bible, to tell you the truth. Um, they're, they're all kind of dysfunctional because that's what human beings are. Relationships are difficult and you have to be able to navigate how to get along when you see things differently. So there's not one approach. That's what I'm saying. You get these three biblical principles down and you're gonna have a great marriage. 
Well, that might not necessarily be true. It, does that make sense? Okay, you might grow in wisdom to keep these principles in mind because it will help you in your marriage or in your money management. But that doesn't guarantee that if the economy goes south, that you use these five biblical principles of money management, and yet you are still on the verge of coming up short every month, right? In your, in your ability to pay your bills and stuff like that, because the economy tanked or inflation went through the roof. Does that make sense, all of that? Okay. All right, one more slide. So what will happen is come around Y2K, there we go, um, there begins to be a shift to a postmodern world where science, philosophy, and ethics have moved on from kind of a strict modern foundational understanding of truth and reality because sometimes fundamentalism gets stuck in that era and, and doesn't continue to to grow beyond it. So we'll talk more about this. But my point as we close up tonight is that the postmodern mindset is more complex and it understands there's a lot of nuance to life that, um, that we can't get stuck in one age or uh, epic, uh, but we have to continue to move forward. And that's where this comes in handy. How do we learn from the stories of the past? Where are they making mistakes that we can make it'll look different in our day and age, but we might be making some of the same mistakes they made, that type of thing. <clears throat> so last point, as our knowledge of the universe grows, we must keep learning and growing in how we understand how God is bringing, is bringing uh, his creation forward. And um, this past Sunday, I, one of the comments that I made in my message was, God is already out ahead of us. You know, we're, it's not like God's catching up to us. We're always stepping into the new elements that God is beginning to reveal to us. So thoughts, comments, questions. Now, this isn't easy, but I think it helps to understand why certain churches look at things the way they look at it and um, why they haven't moved beyond certain things because they think that it's biblical to do it this way, which is connected to inspiration, which is connected to inerrance. They're all interrelated. Yeah, as she said, and that leaves God in the past. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, if, and you you hit a good point. So, with this mentality, <clears throat> God's done speaking in this book, rather than God is still speaking and still teaching and leading and guiding and all that type of thing. So, one of the the phrases that I really love about the United Church of Christ is this phrase that they use: "God still speaks." God still speaks that he's still involved with his creation. I think that's good, a good line. Anything else? <laughs> All right. Well, let me get us out of this and uh, we will uh, close off for tonight. So... All right, now we can see whether your eyes are open because I just enlarged the screen. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> well, I hope you have a great holiday and uh, enjoy the weekend and we'll see you back next Wednesday here, okay? All right, all right, bye.